Throughout history, women have fought, killed, injured and bombed in the line of duty. This program explores the hidden history of women at war. From the 1st century AD to 15th century France, 18th century Russia and the two world wars of the 20th century, we meet the women who've taken up arms, been in the front line, in the thick of battle. The war women, the fighters. Women have played many roles in the conflicts that have shaped the world. As fighter pilots and factory workers, nurses and spies, photographers and journalists, women have often been at the front line of conflict. This is the story of the women who actually experienced battle at the sharp end, the fighters. The earliest celebrated fighters were the Amazons, who were supposed to live in and around what is now modern Turkey. They were reputed to kill male children, burn or cut off their own breasts so that they could shoot arrows more easily and murder their menfolk once they'd had their pleasure with them. Homer tells us they fought at Troy, others that they invaded Libya, a fearsome crew by any standards. Amazons are both historical and a myth. The Greeks probably thought that they existed at some time, um, but then myths grew up surrounding the Amazons, and so it's very difficult to, to work back to the historical reality. Greeks and Romans were fascinated by Amazons and the idea of Amazons, I think partly for the same reasons that we're fascinated by warrior queens. They're unusual. To the Greeks and Romans, they're unnatural. In their society, the woman's place was in the home. She, she was the child bearer, that was her main responsibility. And so the idea of women who spend a lot of their lives outside, who are warriors, taking the man's role in society, that's an inversion of the social norms. That's, the, that's what happens when a society goes wrong, that, that you start getting women who, who are taking the male roles. While recorded history tells us little about the Amazons, one ancient female warrior is ingrained in Western consciousness, Bodicea or Boudicca. Some think that Bodicea, queen of the Iceni, was considered a goddess by her followers, which would explain why she took no prisoners, instead sacrificing captives to appease her fellow gods goddess or just warrior queen, we do know that she led a large-scale revolt against the Roman invaders of Britain in the years 60 and 61 AD. Boudicca was queen of the Iceni tribe, that's uh, modern-day Norfolk. Um, she and her husband, uh, Prasutagus, were allied to the Romans, who at that time were conquering Britain. Um, but when Prasutagus died, Boudicca assumed that she would be able to uh, retain her kingdom and maintain an alliance with the Romans. The Romans had other ideas. They intended to incorporate the kingdom as part of the province of Britain. They came in in a rather heavy-handed manner. Um, they whipped Boudicca, raped her daughters, and as a result of this, Boudicca raised a revolt. She had a spectacular victory against a detachment of the Roman army um, and she then went on with um, other tribes who joined the revolt and together they uh, sacked uh, Colchester, London and St Albans. Bodicea's palace was probably at Gallows Hill near Thetford in Norfolk. 
She'd done well to sack the Roman town of Colchester and defeat the powerful 9th Legion as she marched on London. Here, excavations for the underground's Jubilee Line have produced evidence that her army actually crossed the river, a considerable feat in a running battle. After a further success in St Albans, Boadicea came up against the well-disciplined army of Suetonius, most likely at Mansetta, where Watling Street and the Foss Way meet. Despite releasing a hair between the armies before the battle, a magical rite which lends credence to the goddess theory, Boadicea was defeated. She either took poison or fell ill and died shortly after the battle. It's very difficult to define Boudicca's leadership because our historical accounts of her revolt are written by Romans. And so we have to try to look through the biases of the Romans. But I, th I think a couple of things that, that come through are her ability to unite tribes that before the Romans came were fighting amongst themselves. One of the other things that characterized her leadership, I think, was the brutality she allowed um, the tribes that she was leading um, to commit terrible atrocities um, in, in the Roman towns that they were sacking. And, and, and finally, her, her leadership in the battle. Um, she's, she's supposed to have given powerful speeches before the battle um, to, to, to get the Britons into a, into a warlike spirit. But ultimately, she made a fatal mistake in agreeing to face the Romans in pitch battle. Boadicea's image as a ruthless warrior queen may resound through history, but she was not the only woman to wage war in ancient times. That there were a lot of warrior queens that, that we hear about from, from Greek and Roman history. Perhaps one of the most famous was Cleopatra, uh, the Queen of Egypt. She fought alongside Mark Antony at the Battle of Actium. Her ship may not have been in the front line, but she was there with, with her navy. But uh, it, it's very clear that um, a, a significant number of queens in antiquity were able um, to lead their armies into battle and were accepted by those armies as war leaders. Once the tribal wars of Roman Europe had been superseded by more settled societies, the role of women in the domestic sphere was reinforced. The Dark Ages tell us little of women in warfare, except a hint that they may have been involved. Why else pass a law in 590 at the Synod of Druem Sit in Ireland, prohibiting women from participating in military operations? As Britain emerged from the Dark Ages, tales of Viking rape and pillage in the towns of Britain in the years that followed continued the notion of women as helpless prey to male invaders. They were to be protected by men at all costs. Popular myths and legends of knights defending princesses and rescuing damsels in distress underline the assumption that a woman's proper place was far away from any battlefield. Historically, it would be uh, foolish to underestimate how much of male and female identity is bound up with war and war making. And women come to embody a more pacific image uh, modeled on uh, the, the Holy Mother, uh, the suffering mother, the mother who weeps because her loved ones have been killed. And this is a sort of collective image of women as beautiful souls, as those who are not sullied by violence. <laughs> And there was plenty of violence to be sullied by. As the years passed, stories and legends were buttressed by legal restrictions on women. In 1189, the year of Richard the Lionheart's third crusade against Saladin, Pope Urban II issued a bull banning women from making the journey to the Middle East. It wasn't entirely successful. Eleanor of Aquitaine was only one of many highborn medieval women who ignored the prohibition and went on a crusade. But the established church was increasingly instrumental in defining what women could and couldn't do in wartime. 
Well, the medieval view of women was of women as both producers and reproducers, if you will. But the view certainly was that there were classes of persons who were not to wield military instruments, instruments of death. That included women, and it included priests who had forsworn use of violence. So the church's attitude was one of real objection. The power of the church to decide who fought and who didn't was to be tested to the limit by one heroine. Ironically, one whose religious fervor fueled her military exploits. She was a medieval French peasant girl who provided the country with courageous military and moral leadership that reversed the decline of its fortunes during the Hundred Years' War. She became known as Joan of Arc. I'm a fan of Joan of Arc. I like to think she's the greatest military leader, greatest female military leader that the world has ever known may not say much because there haven't been a lot of leaders, but she really was special. And she was exactly what she said, or she did exactly what she said she would, which is to go in, defeat the English, drive them um, away from the, the Loire River area, and uh, essentially turn the tide of the Hundred Years' War. Joan came from Domremy and started hearing voices at the age of 13, telling her to drive the English out of France. The Dauphin, Charles VII, was due to be crowned king at Reims, but it was held by the English. Joan told him of her mission from God, and realizing her ability to raise morale and inspire troops with her holy mission, he gave her command of an army, with which she raised the English siege at Orleans and defeated them at Pâté in 1429, before taking Reims, where the King of France was duly crowned. She remained popular with her troops despite making daily mass compulsory and banning the army of prostitutes that followed the troops. Joan can go to and talk to the, the common soldiers. She's one of them. She doesn't have the class distinctions that the noble leaders do. And so she's very good in this way. There are other leaders that can do this, but Joan seems to have been able to do it very, very well. And this combined with her mission from God means that on a tactical level and on a strategic level that she actually perfor performs a generalship uh, that few in the Middle Ages could have uh, duplicated. But once King Charles of France was crowned, he no longer needed Joan or probably much appreciated her popularity, so he withdrew his financial support. Joan was captured at Compiègne and was accused by the British of refusing to submit to the church. Charges of being unchaste and of heresy had to be dropped, but she was still found guilty and burnt at the stake by the English, an act for which the French have never forgiven them. She inspired the armies for a year, she inspired them well, and perhaps her death inspired him even more. Her preparedness to die for a cause while leading an army of men who were prepared to fight and to die, to kill and to be killed, at the time had a powerful mobilizing effect. And one can understand the lingering resonance of that image uh, without much difficulty. If you see the fusion of military imagery, church imagery, the image of the virgin martyr, all of it coming together in this one iconic figure. When we think of Joan on the battlefield, we always see her dressed as a soldier. It was a pragmatic decision, and one that was to be copied by a number of female combatants in subsequent wars. prominence, Joan of Arc had to behave and dress like a man. Assuming male identity in order to gain acceptance as a combatant was common to the experience of many women in war, but there was great resistance to this apparently unnatural behaviour. King Charles I, for example, issued a proclamation banning women in his armies from wearing men's clothing. In 1642, England was plunged into a civil war that pitted father against son, brother against brother, and also, it appeared, sister against sister. However they were dressed, women were drawn inexorably into this savage struggle. 
Women served as soldiers in the Civil War, particularly in Ireland. There are good examples of elite women who served um, defending their homes. Um, Lady Forbes defended her castle against a siege, as did Lady Dowdle. There are also examples of troops of women who fought with long knives against English forces. These again are Irish women, but fighting in England. Women were used by both sides, both the parliamentary and the royalist forces in the English Civil War. It's interesting, though, that both sides also used them for propaganda purposes. So, for instance, the parliamentary forces would say, um, you know, Charles much, must not have much of an army if he has to rely on women leaders or women soldiers or, or women spies. They also claimed that perhaps the forces that used women were feminized. And so both sides used them, but both sides downplayed their roles as well. A century later, as Britain sent military men to conquer distant territories, there were numerous instances of soldiers in the British forces turning out not to be good men and true. In a London pub in June 1750, James Gray, a member of the crew of HMS Swallow, calmly announced to the assembled sailors that he was, in fact, a woman called Hannah Snell. She had had a formidable career. She was left by her husband about when she was about six months pregnant and she tried to find him and her way of doing that was to pass as a man and became James Gray, became a cabin boy. She later found out that her husband had actually been killed for, for murdering somebody. Um, but she continued to pass as James Gray um, and clearly enjoyed it. She took great pains to conceal her sex and whenever any male colleagues uh, doubted her sex, she always outperformed them in their masculinity. You also have a woman like Christian Davies from the 18th century. Her husband goes missing and she spends the next 12 years going to find him. I mean, what's interesting about these stories often is that you can read between the lines that women give a very sort of plausible and acceptable reason for going off. In other words, they're going to look for a lost husband or um, they go off because they're following their lover. But in fact, quite often what they're doing is that they're going off because that's what they want to do because their choices are very limited. While women like Hannah Snell and Christian Davis had largely private reasons for serving as soldiers, others were stirred by a patriotic fervor that was to lead to the birth of a nation. The American Revolution brought with it bloodshed and confusion for all its new citizens. In the chaos, with law suspended and society riven by differing allegiances, there was little to prevent women from throwing themselves into the life and death struggle. There were no policies in place for how women could or could not participate during the Revolutionary War. Obviously, there was no defining central government yet to dictate policies. And even had there been, the former colonists were so independent-minded that they probably wouldn't have paid attention anyway. We aren't really sure how many women fought in the American Revolution. At least three are known to us. The most famous is probably Deborah Sampson, who disguised herself as a man, assumed the alias Robert Shirtliff, and served in a Massachusetts regiment. She wasn't discovered to be a man until she was seriously wounded. Deborah, who was born of Mayflower stock in Plimpton, Massachusetts, grew up on a farm in Middleborough, a foster child among 10 boys. She volunteered as a soldier in 1782, rapidly gaining a reputation for courage and tenacity. She took part in numerous desperate skirmishes against pro-British strongholds near New York. At Tarrytown, her forehead was gashed by a saber and she was felled by a musket ball. Somehow, she managed to fool the doctors. But when she was later laid low by a fever, her identity was revealed. She was honorably discharged in 1783. 
After the war, she writes a memoir about her experiences. And one of the ironies that I love is that she goes off and she, she does a sort of display with her musket, and then she'll give this little lecture, and she begins it by apologizing for being so unwomanly. But um, when she's writing her diary, she says that she really loves the fact that everyone looks at her and thinks that she's a boy. They mistake her for a boy. And you often get that sense of these women really gaining a great deal of pleasure out of, I guess, fooling people, pulling it off, and being mistaken for something other than who and what they really are. Uniform makes you blend in with the crowd, with an army, for example. But it also marks you out as different to the vast mass of civilians. I have a sharp memory from the Gulf War of putting on uniform and the feeling that it changed both status and image and my relationship with the viewers. Without doubt, the outstanding female military leader of the late 18th century was Russia's own Iron Lady, Empress Catherine the Great. She was a formidable person. Having deposed her husband, Peter III, she seized power and held it by sheer force of intellect and personality. Well, Catherine the Great was an extraordinary woman who um, rode into um, St. Petersburg on her horse, um, as shown in a wonderful painting by um, Vilnius. And um, she was very well known for her um, grasp of military strategy and tactics. She was an incredibly intelligent woman and wanted, I think, to show that um, she could be um, thoughtful as well as powerful and um, would often be seen running around in um, guards regiment uniforms and uh, armed with pistols and swords and looking very, very regal and warrior-like. As Empress, she effectively neutralised Poland by putting another of her lovers on the throne. With the aid of a third, Gregory Potemkin, she wrested the Crimea from the Ottoman Empire and cemented Russia's hold on the northern coast of the Black Sea. Catherine the Great uh, was extraordinarily effective as a military leader, in part because of her capacity uh, to mobilize the, the noble men um, who uh, did the fighting in those days, or who at least called the men to arms who did the fighting. Uh, and she did this in a variety of ways, through again showering favors on those who, um, who did her bidding and by punishing those who refused. Uh, she faced at a couple of points uh, sort of insurrections and yet she was able to mobilize her own supporters in part through the clever use of, of boudoir diplomacy to come to her side. Uh, and this made her again an effective war leader even though of course she, she never uh, pulled a Joan of Arc sort of number and put on a military uniform and went out uh, to actually ride to battle. You don't have to do that to be a tremendously effective war leader as she demonstrates. Twelve years after Catherine's death of natural causes, at the other end of Europe, a female folk hero who certainly did pull a Joan of Arc number, but probably with the minimum of boudoir diplomacy, was about to establish herself in military folklore. She took part in the Spanish Peninsular War of 1808, that saw the armies of Britain, Spain and Portugal locked in a fight to the death with Napoleon's forces. It was a conflict that escalated quickly into one of the bloodiest wars Europe has seen for both men and women. Napoleon's forces killed thousands of Spaniards, both civilians and soldiers. The Spanish town of Saragossa endured two bloody sieges during the early years of the war. The privations and sufferings of its citizens came to epitomize the horrors endured by the whole population during the French occupation. What occurred on the city walls gave not only the besieged townsfolk, but also the country, a heroic martyr whose courage and sacrifice became a rallying cry. So much the better that the martyr was a woman. Agustina Dominic, known to history as the Maid of Saragossa. The Maid of Saragossa famously 
rallied the effete menfolk of Saragossa by running around the ramparts of the city firing cannons and exhorting men to come and stand and fight like men instead of cowering like women. And of course the myth is that because this was a woman who was telling men to fight like men and not cower like women, that she was, that she, she embodied all those heroic masculine qualities of resistance and valour and fortitude. Meanwhile, across the Atlantic, the arguments between the northern and southern states were making peace increasingly untenable, until in 1861, clashing convictions about slavery finally propelled America into civil war. After four years of struggle that saw 10,000 armed engagements and some 380 major battles, peace was signed. By that time, over 620,000 combatants had died, and a significant number of them were women who fought in the front line for both northern and southern sides. We will never know exactly how many women served as soldiers during the American Civil War because they were pretending to be men. One contemporary estimate was that there were about 400 women in the Union Army alone, and there may have been more, there may have been less. We'll never really know because they tried very, very hard to keep their secret. Try as they might, they were not always successful, and the press seized upon their stories of what they portrayed as a sort of sexual deceit with enthusiasm. There's some really wonderful examples of women attempting to uh, be recruited, signing on, and then getting found out because, for example, they try and put their trousers on over their head. Their table manners are too dainty. They don't laugh at the right jokes. I mean, there are all sorts of ways in which their feminine behavior sort of leaks through. But one exception is Sarah Emma Edmonds, who was a Canadian woman who had already been living as a man. She'd been working as a Bible salesman in New England. And she winds up in Michigan just at the outbreak of the American Civil War, and she signs on. And strangely enough, she's involved in this terrible accident when a mule falls on top of her. Um, so, but rather than, be, rather than be found out, because she says that would bring a great deal of shame upon her, she actually leaves and is, becomes an army deserter. And then after that, she writes um, what becomes a best-selling book in America about her experiences. Another combatant, disguised as a man who wrote her memoirs but got a far worse reception, was Cuban-born Loretta Velasquez. She joined the Confederate Army and fought at the Battle of First Manassas. She was wounded at Shiloh and managed to escape from Fort Donelson before its capitulation to the Union Army. Most Victorian women, no matter what they did during the war, tended to write of it in very self-effacing ways because that was socially acceptable. Velazquez, on the other hand, bragged about her exploits, took particular glee in writing about battle and how many soldiers she knows she killed. She answered to no one and made no apologies for any of the things she did. She wrote very frankly about her multiple marriages in a time when the heroines of adventure novels were always very chaste and virtuous, Velazquez was not, and she never pretended to be. And that was at the root of why later historians were so dismissive of her, is her refusal to even pretend to be a proper Victorian lady. Any 
many lingering remnants of the Victorian lady notion of womanhood were shattered by the conflict that tore Europe apart in the early 20th century. If women in general didn't find it any easier to become accepted as combatants, there were individuals who now had the confidence to press the issue. During the First World War, Flora Sands was one of the first to put her head literally above the parapet. Sands was an English clergyman's daughter who went off to serve with the Red Cross and ended up fighting in the Serbian army. She fought through every single campaign with the Serbian army, and I think that that's why the men had such huge respect for her. And it's extraordinary to see these photographs of Flora literally in a foxhole with her tin hat with everyone else. And you know, it's so extraordinary and so wonderful, really, that this woman who's 40 and has been a secretary all her life and probably had not that much to do with men quite happily takes on this completely different identity and really becomes one of the men really identified with them. Flora left Charing Cross for Serbia on the 14th of August 1914, ostensibly for a three-month stint as a nurse. In southern Macedonia in the summer of 1915, she could have retreated with the Red Cross to Albania, but she chose to join the Serbian army as a private. By the 15th of November, she was in the thick of it, but still managing to uphold standards. Called at nine o'clock, saw a dead Austrian, had tea 400 yards from the Austrian lines, drove back under fire, had lunch and dinner with Mr. Kafala and the Prince. By 1917, Flora is clearly getting stuck in. She wrote on the 13th of May, trenches all night, went on patrol with Dodich in no man's land. We got down as near as we could to the Bulgar trenches, four of us, and sent over a few rifle bombs. They sent up very lights, but we lay low till it was dark again and then crawled back. It's good sport. Her diaries indicate that despite her situation, she remained a very English lady. They're packed with what hoes and good sports and tales of jolly adjutants. However, it's clear that Flora Sands was at the heart of the action and was accepted as a soldier by all of those around her. There's one point where she's um, recuperating. She's got a bit of R&R &R that's due her. And uh, she goes into what turns out to be a brothel with a group of men, it's a kind of cafe. And this woman comes and sits on her lap and doesn't realize that she's a woman and starts making comments about, oh, this, this lovely young man. And she kind of laughs it off, but it's very interesting that, you know, she has to kind of play along. She, you know, she doesn't tell this woman who she really is. This is Flora Sand's gun, and she used it when she was fighting in Serbia from 1915 onwards. It was a very bitter conflict on that front, and um, she joined the Serbian army in an attempt to work with them to halt the German advance. And um, she was promoted to Sergeant Major, which is an incredible feat for a woman, um, uh, particularly in a foreign army. You can see that it's, it's very well worn. She, she kept it by her throughout her time in Serbia obviously to protect herself and also to fight against the, um, the enemy. It's um, one of those things that is a very sort of personal item um, that she obviously felt very comfortable having at her side. Having risen to the rank of Sergeant Major, Flora Sands was also awarded the Kara George Star in 1916, the first woman in Serbia ever to receive this honour. She worked tirelessly to raise consciousness of the country's cause and was depicted in the British press as a kind of Serbian Joan of Arc. She married one of her fellow officers, Yuri, but later, as with many soldiers, she found it difficult to adjust to civilian life. She died in England and her memorial is at Marlesford in Suffolk. The Great War also saw another extraordinary chapter in the story of women on the battlefield. Maria Bochkaryova, the third daughter born into a peasant family from Tomsk in Siberia. She persuaded the new Soviet war minister, Alexander Kerensky, to let her form an all-women battalion. They styled themselves the Battalion of Death. 
Her speech to the new battalion reveals something of the fierce pride, the determination and patriotism that Botskaryova hoped to bring to bear against Russia's German enemy. Идите с нами утереть слезы и заживить раны России. Укройте ее своими жизнями. Мы, женщины, превращаемся в тигриц, чтобы защитить наших детей от позорного ерма, защитить свободу нашей страны. Well, when Maria Bochkareva canvasses women from all across Russia, she ends up with a group of 2,000. And what she does is she puts them through a pretty rigorous training. And I think that what happened was that there were a lot of women who showed up uh, wearing sort of lots of jewelry and lots of makeup and thinking this might be a good idea, but actually just couldn't, you know, just couldn't make the grade in terms of their training. So what you end up with is this small group of 300 who do indeed go off to fight, and apparently they were mixed with a group of men, so that there, there was partly a male regiment that was with them, and there would be a man, a woman, a man, a woman. But in fact, it ended up there were actually more men than women fighting with them. Useful as they were as a propaganda tool for the newly formed Soviet government, the battalion actually suffered heavy losses. Not everyone agreed that women should be fighting in the front line. Florence Farnborough, an English nurse working in Russia and an acute observer of the war, wrote of their exploits. Some remained in the trenches fainting and hysterical. Others ran or crawled back to the rear. Botchkaryova retreated with her decimated battalion. She was wrathful heartbroken, but she had learned a great truth. Women were quite unfit to be soldiers. Unfit or not, while further west thousands were dying in the trenches of Passchendaele and Ypres, the Battalion of Death had lived up to its name. Of the 300 who fought, a hundred were either killed or severely wounded. After the Russian Revolution in October 1917, the party promoted the idea that men and women were equal, aiming to overturn centuries of tradition and convention. In the democracies of the West, this was paralleled by the struggle for women's suffrage. This further sharpened opinions on the role of women in warfare. What had previously been a religious or cultural question was now a prominent political issue. The division came to a head in the Spanish Civil War of the 1930s. Early resistance to General Franco's military coup came from the trade unions and workers' organizations who were the first to mobilize. Without the prescriptive control of a national government, women joined the ranks and went to the front line as combatants. The image of women fighting at the front from the Spanish Civil War, and they do go wearing overalls dressed just like the militiamen, they carry rifles, they hang off armoured cars and so on, has a very negative effect outside Spain. There is a real fear of Soviet communism, and this image of armed women fighting for a left-wing cause seems to reinforce that. And that is one of the reasons why the Popular Front government sends women back from the front in September 1936. The Francoist side, which though is not overtly fascist, has got a strong fascist component and there is a fascist party, they always prize themselves on the fact that, as they put it, their women never wore trousers and certainly never carried guns. But the Francoist side had no hesitation in adopting a woman, the Maid of Saragossa, who had helped to raise the siege a hundred years earlier, as a symbol of tradition, strength and sacrifice. She is a heroine during the Spanish Civil War, but only to one side, which is in fact the Francoist side, who make a great play of the Maid of Saragossa, because even though she fires the cannon and she exhorts the men to come back and stand their positions, she only does it in desperation. She only does it as an emergency response to an emergency situation, which is the Francoist view of women's mobilization. It's an emergency response to an emergency situation, and they should exhort men to behave like men, while they should, once that moment has passed, return to 
the home and uh, do the, provide the kind of support and succour that women are put on this earth to provide. And sure enough, when Franco triumphed, he lost no time, aided and abetted by the Catholic Church, in reducing women to the status of dependence. Their plight, though, was soon forgotten in the titanic struggle against fascism in the rest of Europe. Country after country fell to Hitler's Wehrmacht, and the British expeditionary force retreated back across the channel from Dunkirk. While the RAF fought the Luftwaffe for control of the sky, civilians were forced to face the terrors of the Blitz. In her darkest hour, how did Britain mobilize her female population? The range of roles women fulfilled in World War II was, was absolutely enormous. Initially, the idea was it will be clerical driving and domestic duties and very much away from the front lines. They wouldn't be under fire, and they certainly wouldn't bear arms either. If British women were to be kept well away from the front, elsewhere there were fewer limits to their participation. When Hitler's ill-fated Barbarossa campaign in Russia brought with it unimaginable devastation, suffering and death, Soviet women played their full part in repelling the German invaders as soldiers and as pilots. There were, for example, some 2,000 women snipers operating throughout Russia. But of that number, only 500 survived the war. The best known of these was Ludmila Pavlichenko, a 24-year-old history student who shot and killed 309 German soldiers as the bitter fighting raged in this most savage of campaigns. She survived the siege of Odessa and visited London in 1942 to support the British women's war effort. But in a country that's queasy about the idea of women combatants, what do you give a woman sniper as a gift? A shiny new pistol, obviously, but also a sterling silver teapot. I mean, the Soviet women made an incredibly important contribution militarily during the Second World War. I mean, if you think about the the 588th Air Regiment, which was composed entirely of women and had 4,000 members. They flew something like 24,000 missions. Um, there were hundreds of sorties every night, and these women were up in the air taking their life in their hands. Um, and so I think that, you know, they really set a very important precedent in the Soviet Union, and I think that they really proved that obviously women could do these kinds of jobs. But I think that just in terms of, you know, being a woman sitting in a cinema somewhere and seeing those images of those women either acting as snipers or women flying planes or women being medics, I think that that really must have given women some idea of being able to identify themselves in a different way, that those kinds of occupations and those kind of activities would be open to them. I think that that really does mark a kind of shift in something which is very, very different from what's going on in the West at the time. From Berlin, from Rome, from Tokyo, the campaign started. Propaganda to confuse, divide, soften up their intended victims. The Nazi view of women was encapsulated in the phrase Kinder, Kirche, Kirche, children, church and kitchen. Their principal value to the Third Reich was as breeders of the master race that would inherit the world. They brought together large groups of young men and young girls for human breeding. Of course, the children from this assembly line belonged to the state to be scientifically trained for conquest. For all its idealized public view of national womanhood, Nazi Germany had little hesitation in putting them into uniform in some specific jobs to play their dreadful part in the horrors of Hitler's final solution. Women played a role in the death camps in a variety of ways. Uh, some women were um, commandants or assistant commandants at these camps that actually helped to run the camps, the machinery of death. There were 65,000 prisoners at Belsen. 28,000 women and children were still alive when the Allies arrived. Most of the guards were unable to get away. Kramer, the camp commander, is today condemned and will pay for his crime along with, along with his accomplices, men and women. For there were women among them 
women even more debased and cruel than the men. And there are, of course, some horrific stories from those who survived the camps of uh, the brutality of some of the women inside the camps, including the brutality of women who were in the, the so-called hospital wing or the commissaries who would, who would um, treat prison, uh, injured or ill prisoners with, with extraordinary brutality. And women were the nurses who often injected lethal doses of various medications into the arms of children to kill them off because a child had cerebral palsy or a child had epilepsy. Uh, so you have women playing in a way in the uniform, literally the uniform of the woman as the giver of life and the woman as the nurturer of life, uh, killing children because they're mentally retarded or because they're physically disabled. If the Second World War reminded us that women in uniform can act with cruelty and brutality equal to men, it also taught us, if we were in any doubt, that they are also capable of extraordinary courage and heroism. Now, in the 21st century, women play a more active role in the armed forces and conflicts around the world. And crucially, a world media reports their activities, be they suicide bombers or American privates. So, does this mean that women have gained acceptance? Nikki Smith, who serves in Cyprus, is the first woman to command an RAF helicopter squadron. It's what she's always wanted to do, and for her, gender is not an issue. Whenever things do get a little bit more tense, the professionalism just kicks in um, and you do what you've been trained to do. So um, the only time that you think about it really is in the bar afterwards. When people go into a conflict situation, they don't really have much opportunity to think about how they feel. They just have to get on and do the job, do the job as they've been trained to do it. I have met some um, American USAF um, female pilots. The Americans are about 10 to 15 years ahead of us in terms of opening up opportunities for women in the military. And really they've got far more female pilots than we have and a female air crew. So I think it's a, a good predictor for the future for the UK military. That said, we've had uh, females in the Air Force now for uh, in flying jobs for uh, well over 10 years and we're really getting quite used to it. And increasingly we'll see uh, more women uh, filling the many roles that are now available to us. A recent Ministry of Defence report examined the role of women in the military. As well as addressing the question of strength and physical ability, it looked at the thorny problem of the effect of women on their male comrades in arms. Women have a particular impact on unit cohesion, it is feared, because, for example, of relationships forming between women and men within units, and also because it is feared that men are more likely to abandon their mission and to try and protect an injured woman than they would be if it were a male comrade. So the MOD report brings up these issues. It also concludes, however, that it is impossible to ascribe any characteristic to an individual on the basis of their gender, which is an interesting conclusion in that it contradicts another point made in the report, which is that there is still more research needed on whether there are any psychological reasons for why women are unsuited for combat. So one of the issues it raises is that women are less aggressive than men and that it takes them longer to be prepared to be aggressive. And what isn't clear in the research is whether is how to divide nature and nurture, and of course you can't. On those very few occasions when I've seen men fighting mad, they were soldiers and they'd reached a pitch of aggression which I found completely alien, something I'd never experienced as a woman. Whatever the future is to be for women in the military, no one, though, can deny that for centuries women have fought in some of the most crucial conflicts in our history. They may have been forced by prejudice and convention to fight for their right to do so, but that's an achievement in itself, and they're here to stay. <laughs>